Greetings to everyone with us. On behalf of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, I would like to welcome you to the sixth lecture of the GP2 lectures this academic year. This series is organized by the St. John Paul Second Institute of Culture, which is part of Faculty of Philosophy here at Angelicum in Rome. This lecture, as well as the entire GP2 lecture series, could not have taken place without the support of our university authorities, Father Thomas Joseph White, Director of the Angelicum, and Father Serge Thomas Bonino, the Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy, whom I would like to thank. Special thanks as also in order for the founders of St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, donors and supporters of the Institute, or audience, and all viewers in front of the screens. The St. John Paul II Institute of Culture was established to look at the challenges facing the modern world and the church in light of the life and thought of St. John Paul II. The idea of thinking with John Paul II has been embodied in the GP2 lectures series, which are monthly lectures of prominent interdisciplinary scholars who revisit the extraordinary contribution of John Paul II for our own times. At the previous GP2 lectures, we had the honor of hosting Professor Helen Alford. In her lecture, Sister Alford looked at the crisis of Europe with particular emphasis on economic crisis. In light of Catholic social thought, her goal was to point out what the church can offer to Europeans to help confront the various problems and crises, and in the light of the thought of John Paul II, what this could mean for the mission of the church in Europe today. In our series, planned for this entire academic year 2022-2023, we host such eminent lecturers as Rasa Rino, Father Thierry Dominique Ombres, and Father Francisque Longchamp de Berrier. Now, I'm pleased to give the floor to Father Michael Paluch, who will share more about our today's guest speaker. Good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, it is my honor and my great pleasure uh, to introduce to you Dariusz Karłowicz, philosopher, lecturer, publicist, book publisher, co-founder and editor-in-chief of the philosophical yearbook Theologia Polityczna, Political Theology, and president of the St. Nicholas Foundation. Don't think that this list is comprehensive, you should understand. <laughs> In 1997, he was awarded the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences. Uh, he wrote his dissertation under the supervision of Professor Juliusz Domański, very famous Polish historian of philosophy and philosopher. Uh, in 2005, he published the book Socrates, Socrates and Other Saints, which deals with the philosophical foundations of the ideas represented by the early Christians and the fathers on the, uh, of the church. The book resonated with the public and received positive reviews in both the Catholic and the large circulation mainstream press. So in 2017, the book was translated into English under the title Socrates and Other Saints, Early Christian Understandings of Reason and Philosophy. Dariusz Karłowicz is also co-founder and initiator of the John Paul II Institute of Culture at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, Angelicum. So he is very important for us, our pillar established on the centenary of uh, Karol Wojtyła's birth, and we remain very grateful for this initiative. In his lecture, titled Reset or Revolution, Contemporary Problems of Political Stability and Some Ancient Solutions, Dariusz Karłowicz will reflect on the issue of political and legal stability, 
within Western societies, which despite decades of political projects oriented toward building stability and prosperity, are sinking into ever deeper divisions and forms of entrenched injustice. Kariusz Karłowi Dariusz Karłowicz will ask how the historical experience of civilizational crisis, crisis that occurred over the millennia can help us find a solution to our contemporary crisis of toxic stability, which has been moving away from the vision of a just order for decades. Dr. Karłowicz, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michał, very much for that introduction. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, that's true. I agree that the, the title is Reset or Revolution, Contemporary Problems of Political Stability and Some Ancient Solution. Uh, the West uh, has seen the unprecedented 78 years of peace, post-war Euro-Atlantic peace and security order guaranteed stability and prosperity that was unthinkable before. But if it's so difficult to overestimate the um, advantages of the current state of affairs, why is it being challenged on a level not seen before? Where does all the anger and frustration come from? What did the advocates of a Western order miss, and why is the talk of peace, security, rule of law, progress, and prosperity being dismissed by the rebels? Why in countries that have achieved spectacular political and economic success, such a large group of citizens declare distrust with the European Union, according to the Eurobarometer polls. Why is nearly half, exactly 43, according to the YouGov poll of the American population, expecting a civil war? Why does the majority of Europeans believe that the EU will fall apart in the nearest decade and that war may break out between member states? In a word, why the most important and probably most successful post-war political project of the West is so universally questioned. Stability unknown problem. European history has repeatedly been interrupted by political upheavals and natural disasters. Wars, coup d'etat, assassinations, revolution, terror, resettlement, migrations, market crash, famine, epidemic, they turn upside down the lives of every generation. To remedy the situation, political fall has tried to harness the problem of economic and political instability since antiquity. Quote, remember, says Cicero, the establishment of a state which is stable enough to endure for ages requires by far the highest intellectual powers that nature can produce. That's a quote from Republic, from a third book of Republic, the Republica. Uh, ever since, the politicians have looked into politics, law, economy, and security for ways to reduce the ephemeral nature of political entities, to consolidate peace and to ensure political continuity. And though specific solutions may differ, the main driving force behind all of them was to get away from the terror of the unforeseeable uh, and the changeable towards the comfort of stability that is potentially safe just and prosperous. If we imagine politics as a factory, its main product would be definitely stability. If the word of politics were going anywhere, it would be towards a certain form of stability. Stability has always been the goal, albeit unattainable. 
there is a fine line, fine line between relative calm and prolonged stability. Relative calm and prolonged stability. That's why in the past 78 years we may have missed some fundamental changes. We may have overlooked the fact that we are living in the reality that everyone was seeking, but no one has ever experienced. Having dealt with so many of the old problems, we now found ourselves in the new territory, answering questions and threats we have not known before. And we begin to realize that to our surprise, progress is not the only variable of political order. We realize that political and legal stability comes at a price and is not equipped with a built-in safety valves. Our view of European history makes us think of stability as the absolute good, the one that places all other political goals second. To fully understand why political economic and social structures of the modern world is being increasingly questioned by people in the West, we need to see whether stability itself, after almost 80 years of peace, has become a serious problem that we somehow overlooked. And what if the main political challenge today is the stability of the established order that turns against large groups of political community and takes away the dignity, freedoms and hopes for a better future. Could unadjusted stability have become toxic and inhuman? Desire for revolution. Whatever the representatives of a political establishment in Europe and in the US tell us, the fact is that the populist who in the past were on the margins of a political scene in the West have now taken center stage. Movements that are being described as populist differ in many ways. They may be on the left or on the right of the political spectrum, openly Christian or non-religious, anti or pro-Russian, conservative or progressive. But is there a unifying principle beside the deep contempt for a political elites? Are these movements nurtured by the same wave of the Euro-Atlantic social and political expectation? And if so, how do we explain the strength, durability and vigor? There are many factors that tell us that this time it's not only the matter of uh, new voice finding a place on the political scene, but a total rejection of a post-World War II status quo. The dynamic is not to demand the healing of a system. These are not the political aspiration of the new elites anymore, or calls for a redistribution of, of wealth and prestige, but a total rejection of a status quo. They reject the system in its totality. The disappointed, the embittered, the furious, they've had enough. Polls conducted in February 2019 in Austria, France, Spain, Germany, Poland, and Italy by Institut d'Etudes Opinion et Marketing en France International for l'Atlantico show that almost 40% of French, 20 of Germans, and 14 of Poles think that the only way, the only way to the betterment of their lives is revolution. It is not about being critical or distrustful towards the system, but it's total rejection. It is about a hope for some kind of a brutal reset. Assuming that the respondents understand what the violent, dark, and irrational paroxysm known as revolution is, we need to appreciate that every fifth German 
and four out of ten Frenchmen and women are in favor of a forceful demolition of the existing order. This is not pessimism, but desperation. To seek revolution after the lessons of European history of the 20th century is not to feel utterly helpless, is to feel utterly helpless. Some respondents may take revolution as a metaphor of some kind of fundamental change, of course. But even in this case, it is clear that stability, the most precious product of politics, is seen as the main obstacle in making things better. Let us not be fooled. This is not a handful of lunatics. Why is revolution the only agent of change they believe in? End of hope. I believe we do not fully appreciate the experience of the 2007 and 2008 economic crisis, which in fact undermined the social trust and hope that keeps us all going. It did not turn the system upside down, yet it shook the foundations of liberal and rather, or rather neoliberal, neoliberal West. The axiom of endless progress the dogma of steady growth has collapsed. The crisis undermined the belief that tomorrow will be a better day. It is not the exchange of real estate market that suffered, but the very core of the optimistic metaphysics of a democratic liberal world, of the soothing message of purpose and hope for a better future. Prior to the crisis, belief in progress and better futures softened the brutality of the system, allowed one to make sense of fortunes made on speculation. It kept together the theodicy that called for sacrifice and, at the same time, promised better pay and better life to those whose standard of living fell below those of the wolves of the Wall Street. Why did hope die? The crisis did not affect the system, but hit the most vulnerable. In the positive case scenario, the poor were to get less, but always more than the day before. In the negative case scenario, it turned out that they have to bear the cost. Stability turned out to be more important than solidarity. In the name of stability, the world was saving and protecting the richest, as well as the institutions that were otherwise responsible for madness of a high-risk mortgage market. The rich and the wealthy come out of the crisis without major losses, while the poor just got poorer. And how about the community? If one measures trust in the existing order with the level of hope for a better life within a generation, the result is devastating. It may, may well be that the stability was saved for a price of hope. According to Pew Research Center, I'm talking about polls from August 22, the prevailing mood in many European countries is pessimism. 33% of Germans, 72 of people in Great Britain, 78 of the French, 76 of Italians, and 72 of Spanish people think that the financial situation of the next generation will be worse than the situation of their parents. The crisis of hope that was the unifying principle of the system is plain to see and there does not seem to be any other new unifying principle either. Stability versus democracy. Focusing on stability makes it difficult to see the negative effects of continuation. What do we miss? It seems that during prolonged period of peace, democratic states generate conflict they are not 
able to manage in the long run. The conflict is between the status quo safeguarded by the law and politics and on the other side, the intuition based on the principle of equality and freedom. Politics that successfully stabilizes legal and economic system automatically consolidates hereditary differences in wealth, income, social standing, education, and power share. Simultaneously, through education and the ethos of democracy, politics strengthens the need for freedom and equality defined not only as equality under law or equal opportunities, but as political agency, which allows one to choose and control any form of power. In fact, we are facing the tension between justice and freedom, which Plato says is, typic is typical for democracies. To this tension, the post-war political system added the third factor, time time, or more precisely stability, transform this otherwise positive tension into conflict. As Plato says us, the right kind of balance between justice and aristocratic element, and the more popular element of freedom, protect democracy against anarchy. More importantly, it reinforces the existing order without canceling freedom and equality, the main virtues of democracy by harnessing the capriciousness and the volatility of demos which threaten the state order. Law protects democracy against its potentially self-destructive element. For example, law protects against tyranny or against mob rule so-called autocracy. Post-war system of a democratic state which follows the same model and is built on rule of law is now being destabilized by a longe longevity. The balance now shifts toward the aristocratic element in the system, towards the principle of justice. After 78 years of peace, the system which maintains the stability in fact begins to conserve the mechanism of inheritance of differences and divisions. In practice, it means the cancellation of eg egalitarianism and the advent of the increasingly undemocratic rule of law. Due to the time, fa time factor, a uh, variable which may have seemed irrelevant at first, the democratic component of aristocratic democratic mixed system becomes fiction. The new generation has no chance for every one of its members to have a fresh start from similar positions. The equality and freedom, especially positive freedom, become empty slogans. Although Thomas Piketty claims that the modern concentration of capital is similar to that at the turn of the 19th century, nevertheless, thanks to the democratic culture of equality, we feel the rift between the egalitarian ideal and the aristocratic practice that we find hard to accept. The growing awareness of differences and inequalities is, to stark contrast in the, is in stark contrast with the declared, declared ideal of a political system and hyper-democratic rhetoric in the field of education and culture. Politics reproduces continuity and strengthens egalitarian ideals of democratic cultures. Culture. At the same time, it also highlights the problem of injustice of the prevailing order. The paradox is that the politics places herself in the dock. And there is the rap. This is the source of the unbearable tension between law and general intuition of justice. This is where the revolt begins that will not be settled by major minor adjustment. 
What seems to be fueling the political revolt is the call for a reset. At stake is the reversal of the effects of prolonged stability and almost mythical comeback to the point of departure in which existing divisions and differences do not cancel the egalitarian principle of democracy. The way the protesters see this crisis is through the feeling of a radical lack of political agency. On a systemic level, it means a deficit of democratic legitimization of a current status quo. The polls show a growing disappointment with the state of democracy. According to Pew Research Center, the large majority of population of major European states voices dissatisfaction with the way democracy works in their countries. 43 of Germans, 55% of Brits, 51 of the French, 70% of Italians, 81 of the Spanish. The tensions run high. Those who revolt are not concerned with the banks, with the immigration, with the price of fuel. They call for a reset of political and social order that erases the solidified differences. They want to get rid of the system that casts some into inherited poverty and second-class citizenship and makes other members of an unsinkable elite, regardless of their talents and personal merits. The proper addressee of the aggression, reluctance and frustration is therefore the political system that takes away the chances to start with a clean slate without the inherited debts. I speak of that not only in economic terms, but also in social, political or cultural, about a loan that one never took, but that one has to pay off throughout the lifetime and then hand it over to the children and grandchildren. Therefore, the first requirement in a reset is shaking off those broadly defined burdens obligations and subordination. The problem is that stability preserves poverty as well as the privilege. Hopes for equality and political agency will not be fulfilled without the limits of uh, privileges of uh, beneficiaries of the system. And this is requirement number two. The problem is essentially political. It's about power, the sense of agency, about reclaiming reality that has slipped out of the democratic system of check and balances. The idea is perhaps best illustrated in the LEAF slogan, famous take back control. It is about taking back control over the formal and especially informal centers of power which function beyond the control of a democratic mechanism, beyond the control of a state and international organization, organizations. Unfortunately, the need for a reset that would make things new does not seem to be possible within, within the current rules of the game. I will not dwell on the fact that revolution certainly is not the way to go. I will not dwell on the fact that revolution, uh, uh, neither I am concerned with the myths of perfect equality or agency. The point is that the current political system cannot meet the requirements of even the slightest form of a reset. The power of democratic policy based on a liberal assumption does not extend over the, ter the territory where inequalities are at their worst the territory of social and economic life. Politics may at best preserve inequalities, make slight adjustment, but is not able to reset them. Political instruments that the hope have that the people have during election, political instruments that the people have during elections do not affect the informal power structures. To achieve a peaceful, not revolutionary reset, 
the existing rules need to be redefined. And that, in turn, calls for a broad political consensus. It would also require the beneficiaries of a current system to exercise self-restraint. There are, however, no signs of such readiness for self-control among the elites. Political reset in action now in Mesopotamia, in a Solon case, and in the Old Testament. The need for a system reset is no, is, that is no longer able to settle its internal forces, tensions, and aspiration was not invented by a post-war democratic rule of law, of course. Such a need usually arises in a situation where unadjusted stability becomes toxic and where the void between the intuition of justice and reality becomes unbearable. If, according to Aristotle, relationship between the wealthy and the poor is the biggest challenge in every, in every police, the ability to deal with the calls for a reset or a serious adjustment that would cancel the excessive burdens, limitations, and inequalities is the highest art of every stable politics. Let us have a look at the lessons that distance past teaches us. The aim is not to study history or copy those solutions, but to look closer at the basic tenets that allow one to face the problems of prolonged political stability. Mesopotamia. The institution of debt cancelling in ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt and Greece, has all the features of reset understood as an act of restoring social, political, and ownership balance. Since the debts of the impoverished farmers would lead to land, wealth, and power concentration on one hand, and the loss of poverty and personal freedom on the other, the shaking of the debts was not a purely financial operation. Archaeologists have found around third Jews and obligations annulment acts referring to debts owned by uh, people to the wealthy officials in the period between 2000 400 and 1400 before Christ in Mesopotamia. 30 examples. It seems that the annulment was the guarantee of the stability of the existing political, social, and economic order. The annulment paired with the release from debt slavery and the obligation to either pay compensation or return the property taken over the debts by the lenders was to guarantee peace and stability and to restore the status quo ante. That was destroyed by economic chaos. During the 42 years of Hammurabi rule, there were at least four events of this kind. Without any exaggeration, they may be, first of all, associated with the idea of the protection of the weak against the mighty, expressed in the royal codex. The second motive behind this event is also perfectly clear. That annulment obviously strengthened and stabilized the monarchy. By limiting the power of a court officials, it reduced the risk of change within a political order. Interestingly, the political significance of an element was underlined through the solemn ritual during which clay tablets with the names of debtors were smashed and destroyed. The periodical annulment of debt suggests that the ownership rules were suspended, though they were considered vital to the order and stability of the system. The Mesopotamian practice testifies 
to the sense that is completely absent from the modern world. A sense that the stability of the law does not necessarily entail the social stability. What is more, under certain circumstances, the unterrible law, which is intended to protect the process of wealth concentration, in fact may be a destructive factor within the existing order. A partial suspension of the rules initiated by a ruler becomes the condition for a stability of the existing power and the social structure. The key to the understanding of this practice is that the stability of the state and its political and social model was believed to be the highest good far above the rules of the everyday life of the community. And why is turning the mechanism of stability into an absolute could destroy the political order? This continuity thus becomes a condition for a continuity. Ancient Greece. Let us now move over to Greece. The political fame of Solon was built on the reforms that in many ways may be seen as a model reset. The Athens of uh, early 6th century before Christ saw the growing tension between the wealthy landowners, the Eupatridae, what means of a good father or of noble descent, and their indebted tenants on agricultural land called the hectemeroi, what means six parties, who were obliged to give away the one-sixth of the yield from the land walked by them. The problem escalated and called for an urgent solution. Rising rural population density caused division and shrinking of farms, debt, impoverishment, and debt slavery. By the time in 590, Four before Christ, when Solon, an Eupatrid himself, was elected an archon for one year and was entrusted with a reform mission, according to Herodotus, Athens had already lived through several, several waves of major social and political unrest. According to Plutarch, uh, life of Solon 14, Solon's mandate to reform came in equal measure from both sides of ongoing conflict, the wealthy and the impoverished Athenians. As he took up the role of the um, mediator, Greek dialectus and lawgiver, nomothetes, that's according to the Aristotle, Athenian Politica and Herodotus and Plutarch, Solon had to balance of continuity and change that would satisfy both parties. It was not an easy compromise. On one hand, the impoverished debtors demanded a new land division, redemption from slavery and the abolition of the rule that forced them to give away a sixth of the crops. On the other, the Eupatridae required the slightest necessary concessions. How did Solon meet the expectations? He annulled financial obligations, abolished debt slavery, made possible slave redemption, and introduced debt relief from the debtor's farm. All these were gestures aimed to pacify the hectomeroi. At the same time, he kept the old land divisions, he kept the old land divisions, which was the solution in favor of continuity. And while we mostly remember Solon shaking off relief of burdens, famous Tei uh, few seem to remember the accompanying political and social reforms that made reset possible and effective. The last two reform, the reforms 
are worth mentioning here. The first one is the institution of jury trial, Heliaya. The second one was the close pairing of the citizens' political privileges and duties with one of the four income groups. It seems that both principles were introduced in the second wave of reforms in the period between 592 and 591 before Christ. The trial by jury limited by the judicial monopoly of the aristocracy and strengthened political agency of the people. The alignment of political duties with income groups removed the poorest citizens from offices and reserved the highest officials for the richest. At the same time, it once and for all, the principle for aristocratic rule by birth as the decisive uh, qualification for oligarchy was replaced by the principle of wealth. There are several reasons why Solon reforms can be considered as a paragon of reset. First of all, it was preceded by the mutual agreement of the parties, which created a, let's call it, constitutional moment which ensures legality of a fundamental changes within the pools. Secondly, by modifying systemic monopoly of the Eupatridae, the reforms went far beyond the economic and social sphere. In fact, they took into account the political aspiration of the people. Thirdly, the reforms were the minimal required adjustment they meet the expectation of the sixth parties, those famous hectameroi, and at the same time, they did not cast the Eupatridae into a loser's side. Solon's reset preserves political continuity. In contrast to the reset caused by war or revolution, it was a compromise whereby legal change has been introduced in the name of peace and the balance of justice, which both parties believe were the common good. Old Testament. Yet another interesting example of the institutional reset is the Shabbat year, traditionally observed in Judaism every seven years and the Jubilee year once every 50 years. The Shabbat year, or sabbatical, is mandated by the Old Testament, and while in the case of Mesopotamia we may have doubts as to whether these traditions of reset were indeed systemic, in the case of Judaism, we are dealing with an institution that is part of political system. Its task, is to constantly correct the pathologies of stability. The Shabbat year is celebrated in a seven year cycle and it's analogous to the weekly Shabbat in that it means refraining from work activities. It is also connected with the idea of returning to the initial state to the starting point, point which degenerates with the passing of time and due to human activity. Therefore, the Shabbat year is not only rest for the people and land, but a reset par excellence. It brings the annulment of unwanted yet legal changes, shaking of the debts redemption from debt slavery, release of a land taken for debt. Interestingly, it incorporates a system which calculate prices proportionately according to the time left to the Shabbat, to the Shabbat year, that we can find in Leviticus 25 and the book of Exodus 21. 
Oh, Deuteronomy, of course, 15. Uh, the order to observe the Shabbat years is of the highest seriousness and sanction. According to the book of Leviticus, 25.1, God, God instituted Shabbat on Mount Sinai. Failure to observe the Shabbat year may result in disasters that could affect the entire nation. It is noteworthy that the obligation of the Shabbat year is not an arbitrary commandment. The idea of returning the land to its owner and redemption from debt slavery is theologically granted. In the strict sense, the land of Canaan is the gift from God and reminds his position, as we read in the Leviticus 25.38. Quote, the land also shall not be sold forever because it is mine and you are strangers and sojourners with me. Unquote. Similarly, that slavery may only be temporary. Within the set time, the rights of the owner have to yield to the laws of God himself who freed the Israelites from captivity and become their Lord. Quote, for they are my servants and I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Let them not be sold and bondmen. Unquote. Leviticus 25.42. Quote, another quotation. For the children of Israel, Israel are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. Unquote. Also Leviticus 25.55. The practice of the Shabbat year is the Jubilee year, and the Jubilee year is thus a way to honor God as we read in Deuteronomy, as a liberator, as a liberator. It is a form of paying tribute to the Lord that serves us as a reminder of a non-absolute nature of all men made laws. Quote, and thou shalt sanctify the 50th year and shalt proclaim remission to all the inhabitants of thy land, for it is the year of Jubilee, unquote, Leviticus 25. The basis of reset is freedom that cannot be taken away forever, and the basis of freedom is the relationship of Israel with God. In the light of the above, I would like to make two Remarks. The idea of Shabbat year clearly suggests that stability does not protect against evil and decay and against contingency and uncertainty. In other words, stability does not have any eschatological features. It does not mark the end of history. That is why Keeping order requires certain regular hygiene. It is a constant restoring of the order. Adjustment that chaos calls for is not an action against stability, but rather a political tool that helps to maintain stability. But beware, reset is the temporary suspension of the rules. It does not erase them. Flexibility is the condition of continuity. Like all human reality, no rules are perfect. Evil may appear as we break the rules as much as when we respect them. They are not for their own sake. And if they lead to injustice, they ought to be suspended. Neither are they bad? It is thanks to the rules that the world escapes 
anarchy after the reset. The biblical model of a reset illustrates why the secular politics, the one we live in, tend to absolutize its own rules and procedures. Even the ones that cause a crisis. Without, re the, without references to God, every relativization of rules that reproduce political order and stability, for example, the annulment of the rights of a creditor, possess a risk to the entire system. Where a higher principle is missing, whenever the specific rules are being changed, we fear that we are losing points of reference. The primacy of divine laws above the human laws means that the instituted structures remain flexible and their adjustment does not give an exceptionally dangerous impression that the political order is based on arbitrary rules. In secular models, the contingency of rules remains a sort of a mystery. The rigidity of the rules, the seriousness, alleged immutability and absolutization becomes a security requirement. Political system with transcendental, transcendental references tend to be more flexible since they have the stable point of reference. In that case, the temporary suspension of even important rules, which is necessary to reset the order, does not mean the political apocalypse. And few words of conclusion, let's call them waiting for Solon. All these examples serve to explain why a serious adjustment of the system today is so difficult. Our diagnosis of the origin of the crisis differs depending of where we stand in it. Neither do we have a single vision for the future. Things are not made better by the secularization of politics and the fact that freedom and equality got detached from the ontological ground, the one that would be natural for readers of Torah and the Gospels. That is why what is even worse, the conflict between the people and the aristocracy, or functional aristocracy, has been branded as the conflict between the populist, so-called populist, and so-called oligarchs. The conflict has become a sort of war with only one side destined to be a winner. That's obviously nonsense. The idea of a word without them, word without them, either without the, let's say, dark, needy mob, or without the corrupted elites, is a dangerous fiction. Why is that so? Because the conflict that is defined as existential blocks any hopes for de-escalation that is a condition for a reset and leaves only two ways out. To put it simply, the first one, the first way out, is non-liberal dictatorship, dictatorship. The second is a form of a post-liberal dictatorship that will keep the power and status quo of a current elites in the name of stability, but will radically limit the citizens' freedom and will introduce a sort of a per permanent state of emergency, pretending it to be a temporarily suspended democracy. Both solutions are repulsive. To avoid them, the system has to regain its balance since conflict escalation will only generate chaos and tyranny. We can already see the first symptoms of the two scenarios in Europe. For 
for example, Hungary and in some aspect France, for example. To take a different route, we need an agreement between the modern, modern hectameroi with today eupatrids. If there are any chance for it. Ancient examples show very clearly that modern politics has a marked tendency to absolutize stability and regard every single aspect of a legal order as unalterable. Paradoxically, despite, despite legal positivism and sworn egalitarianism, the modern West behaves sometimes as if laws, especially law of economy, come down from heaven and the elites were born on Olympus. Unfortunately, thinking that stability is an absolute makes us unable to address the hardships and aspirations of large social groups and solidifies differences and divides. This absolutist approach legalizes changes that are increasingly seen as unjust. Stability and rule of law will be protected by those who will embark the decisive reforms and not the ones who shunt the rule of law mantra. The system that is rigid and not flexible in the end destroys the very thing that it aims to protect. West need the courage and gesture of Solon, the cutting down of debts, changes in redistribution log logic, counteraction to capital accumulation, and reforms in the Western legal system that would lead to legal, to real democratization and the agency of the people. If we seek to avoid violent social unrest and dangerous changes to the political system, we need an honest reset. The question whether such fundamental reforms are possible seems to be one of the key issues for restoring and preserving the post-war political order. Is reset possible? I'm not optimistic about it. Not only that there is no necessary common social concern for it, but it is not even being considered yet. As I read that over 60% of Americans believe that political division are deepening and political violence will grow, according to the YouGov research from 2020, And in front of that, the only proposed political solution to the crisis comes down to the principle of more of the same. I find optimism difficult. <coughs> At the moment, the protest parties are buying us time. Contrary to what the old political elites think about them, modern-day modern day populist, unwittingly probably, unwittingly, play the role of Kate Chons, who we hold the revolutionary Armageddon. As long as they are able to persuade the people to cast the voting ballots rather than burn the cities, we have time to work out the reset. The one thing is clear as the sun, this will not last forever. Thank you very much. Dariush, thank you very much for this interesting lecture. And now we have time for questions. And please use the mics. Thank you, Dariush. Yes. Okay. 
Thank you um, for a very interesting, thought-provoking um, talk. And I really don't have a question at the moment. I would just make a comment which you ended with. Uh, coming from America, the challenge. We have historical evidence, as you noted, of where societies, where this reset worked. But today, how many people would accept that? Um, I think that really is the challenge. Basically, we're calling for some prophets like Jeremiah who will end up being buried, I think, in some wells, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, which you did note. So I would just say I would be in agreement with what you're saying. I think there's some definite positives, some, um, as you say, some historical, some theoretical principles which are critical for, for this looking at this reset, but I do see a great challenge. But all things are possible, right? <laughs> Thank you, Darius. Well, I, I agree, it's always a challenge. It's a, it's a chance, that's, that's, that's no doubt. But I think that we, that we are very far from, we are very far from overestimating a level of nowadays social conflict, which is really very high, and we, have, we can find uh, hundreds of polls uh, that show that, but we also see the burning cars on the streets, uh, I don't know, the um, reality of Gilles de Jean uh, uh, movement, which was a purely anti-systemic model even not burning any kind of uh, rulers or elite, um, which is very, let's say, which is worth to, to note. Um, thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. Um, well, I, I was just wondering, uh, because you, you didn't mention the category of solidarity even once, uh, describing the, um, well, everything. So my question would be, well, let, let's divide it into two. Is there any place for solidarity in this um, way of thinking? Can we apply solidarity as a category to describing our societies, European societies right now? And the other question would be, uh, if not, if we cannot, what happened? What happened with the solidarity which was the, which is a pure, evangelical value. Uh, well, talking about solidarity, being Paul, uh, it's not easy to, to abstract from a historical experience and its um, ideological or philosophical importance. Uh, the problem with concept of solidarity is that I think it's grounded very strongly in, a, let's say, religious background. Of course, there are some some walks which was trying to, let's say, secularize the solidarity, but I think they failed. So, of course, we can pass through many different uh, ways to avoid a crisis or to diminish at least um, mm -hmm. healing level of conflict, but uh, I don't really believe that now it is a very possible way. It's rather a question which may be perceived as a pessimistic hope that when you when you analyze those examples, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of a very let's say serious application of a historical analogy to the reality. Uh, I used to I used to think that uh, historical analogy is good as long as it is uh, surfaced. Um, mm, only then in that case. But in a, in, a, in a Solon case, and in many similar, because I mean, I, I, I take three, but we have much more, especially in the Roman history, where the conflict between 
a populist and let's call it aristocracy was very strong and was a very important element of a dynamic of policy. Uh, that, um, that agreement uh, described by Plutarch uh, before Solon start his re reforms, they have a few decades of unrest. So the, let's say the cost, the cost of the egoism was too high probably. That was, that was the reason. So th that's, that's a question because I don't really think uh, reading a lot of uh, a lot of newspapers of a kind of Guardian and and others that uh, there is a readiness to look for a real reason. Uh, so, I mean that what of course we can find some let's call it noble exception, but um, in in the most widespread model, uh, elites are still blaming an effect not looking for reason. Uh, that's, a, that's a climate of uh, rhetoric, which shows also a climate of, let's say, political life in the so-called democratic countries. Father? Thank you very much. Also, I found it very uh, provoking and, and informative your talk. Oh, just a little bit, <clears throat> coming from an American perspective uh, as well, sister. Um, you said at the end that there, there isn't, they're not talking about reset or something to that effect. But I mean, I, I hear a great deal about uh, reset uh, in the United States. You know, the, this, this phrase, uh, build back better. Uh, and, and it seems like rather than, than the, uh, the elite or, or the uh, Aristocracy or whatever, whether it's wealth or whatever, the ones with power, trying to maintain their their the status quo because they're in a privileged position. It, it's as if they're trying to tear things down. They're they're not trying to, you know, they're not they're not trying to maintain stability. They're trying to tear down to build up something something supposedly better. But but whether it's better or not is is, is questionable. But uh, I, I see very much uh, this this uh, going around this idea of of, of reset. A great reset, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, tearing down and building. They don't say tearing down, but they certainly say build back better. This is very much uh, uh, running rampant in the United States, and I don't know if in Europe it's. Mm -hmm. it's uh, mm -hmm. Of course, I'm. I'm. I mean, I'm using the other definition of reset. Of course, there are some some projects of so-called great reset, but that's rather a, a concept of aristocratic order, which. Uh, I would define it as a kind of that what I cost, what I called post-liberal dictatorship, in fact, or post-liberal oligarchy, which diminished um, individual law, um, the concept of the 15-minute states, if I'm not wrong, is very, let's say, in that, st in that style, or the enthusiasm in front of uh, Chinese model of a point system, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but it's not a reset in the meaning I I, I, I was talking on. Father Palu. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really a great refreshment to, to listen to your analysis. And, uh, and I think that first of all, to, to um, dare to think about stability as something uh, toxic, which, which may really be holding up us uh, uh, right now. Uh, I think that it is a very, a very just uh, analysis, and I think that, that it should be uh, a little bit more developed. Uh, 
So, so I have to say that I heard the word solidarity in your in your talk, <laughs> and and even I I I, I, I uh, jotted it down, and I considered it the most important, perhaps, uh, sentence in 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 the whole talk. Stability more important than solidarity, as as a, uh, as as your proposal of. Um, well, yes, of one of the interpretations of the, of the crisis 2007-2008. I, I buy it, and obviously I buy it as a, as a Christian. From, mm -hmm. from this Christian perspective, I think that it is a very, very good uh, description of what happened. And, uh, well, as far as I remember, it's in agreement with uh, Caritas in Veritate, with uh, Benedict's uh, analysis as well. Anyway, but as, as you should understand, as a, as a son of the uh, Order of Dominicans, uh, listening to you, I, how to say, I was probably tempted, so you will help, you know, to overcome this temptation, uh, to see some, how to say, some problems in, in, in your interpretation and in your talk. Uh, I want to avoid some stronger words that used... Uh, uh, to be used in in the order before, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 my first my, my first objection and my, my first question is whether you know. Well, I, I would like just you know to, to, to present some criticism concerning the point, uh, uh, the starting point of your analysis, and then to propose my. My adjustment, if you if you don't mind, yes. So, so the first the first objection would be whether you know this uh, tension you tried to describe, law, uh, on the one hand, on, on the, and, and the, on the other hand, general intuition of justice. Is not a little bit too platonic, platonic that that we are trying, you know, to. Uh, to get the starting point, which, which, which is some, uh, from this point of view, questionable for someone who would like, who would prefer, you know, to think in terms, for example, stability, solidarity. So you know, it's much more incarnated point uh, of departure. The second, the second objection, uh, objection, your question. Yes, you know, my my, my doubt a little bit. Wasn't it a little bit too Marxist, <laughs> so to say? Be because you, you focused so much on, on debts, on this economic uh, crisis which should be overcome. And I understand that, that the point of departure is uh, our crisis 2007-2008. So because of that, it was absolutely justified to look in the history for, uh, for this kind of resets. Yeah? Nevertheless, my question is whether, uh, whether it shouldn't be a little bit broadened and widened and we should take into account uh, many more factors if we think about, uh, about our situation today. And now I'm coming, you know, to, to my proposal of a description of, 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 of uh, uh, our situation and the point of departure. I would say that, that first of all, and you mentioned it in your analysis, uh, and, and you developed a little bit even, even uh, on that, the crisis of representation. So you know the crisis of represent, representation, representation we, we see that the mechanisms of politics uh, don't function anymore. So people feel that, well, uh, what they see, it's not, it's not themselves. So, so, so it's, it's, it's the first factor I, I, would, I would present as, as very important here to, to understand our situation. And the second one, which is how to say we should be added to the first one and to some extent, to extent is uh, how to say the explanation of the first one is uh, our contemporary lack, lack of ideology. So you know, in, in, in the background. So you know, what I mean, ideology is something absolutely neutral. Uh, I would describe it as, a, as conviction about where we want to go. So you know, if we take into account that, that we don't feel represent, uh, represented by, by, by the political, different political movements, and at the same time, 
we, we don't know where we want to go more and more, mm -hmm. yeah? So, you know, the result of it is, you know, just a simple no to what is happening without any positive content inside because mm -hmm. we, we, are, uh, we are getting more and more unable to, to have some uh, positive uh, political vision and, 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 and proposal. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be my, my question. So you know this mm -hmm. platonic point of departure, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit too Marxist mm -hmm. <laughs> to provoke mm -hmm. you as you understand mm -hmm. analysis and, and then isn't it more um, uh, adequate to, 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 you know, to, 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 uh, to start the analysis with those two, mm -hmm. two factors? Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's, uh, as you agree, as you all agree, it's a complex question. Uh, but starting with those uh, conflict of those two uh, elements, the justice and freedom. Of course, uh, it, it comes from, it comes from, I, I, I own it to, to, to the, mm, uh, to the, the, uh, um, um, Platonic analysis of democracy, but it's very well grounded in the let's say empirical, empirical, uh, 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 democratical processes. The conflict in Athens between uh, uh, courts and democracy, for example, described by Christian Miller uh, during fifth century, was exactly conflict socially speaking between aristocracy and demos and institutionally speaking, between court and, let's say, and the voting system, or, oh, okay, let's call it on the, on, on the way. So, um, and I think it's very well grounded in the post-war um, uh, political order in Europe, especially, where the, um, which was focused on the idea to avoid a risk of repetition of the history of uh, Middle War Germany, which degenerate, it was a democracy which degenerate itself in the brutal dictatorship. So idea was how to create a political system in which uh, element, democratical element will be present, but controlled by something. It, it, gives, it gives a power of a Kelsen idea of a constitutional court. Before the Second World War, we have a constitutional, constitutional court only in two countries, in Austria and in Czechoslovakia, because of a Kelsen. But after war, that element of a judicial, judicial control over democracy, which is very limited. In fact, I mean, we, we, we used to call the system we are living in democracy, but I mean, what kind of democracy is it? I mean, our, our, uh, our influence is reduced to the, to the election once four or five years, and we elect between the actors who are usually chose by someone without our presence. That's why, in fact, what we see in the polls in last year is that the, even in politics, which is still not the bigger problem, even in politics, the, the poll shows that the people do not believe on any impact on reality through through elections. I mean, uh, I remember the big polls by Pew Research uh, Center, which shows that people really think that whoever you choose that will be the same. I mean, you have no influence on politics. Uh, so the fact is that that aristocratical element in nowadays uh, political life becomes stronger and stronger, not only because of uh, economical uh, reason, 
which are of course important. Uh, well, uh, uh, I am not a Marxist, uh, and I must insist that uh, conflict between P, uh, poor and wealth was defined as a, one of a fundamental feature of, of a political risk, risk, not need, but risk, that's also not Marxist, by Aristotle in politics. I mean, and that conflict, and I think that description is very good. Of course, the situation in which that conflict start to be destructive for police, for a state, it's a moment where, where we have to act and look for reset, for example. Uh, the problem is, that's, that's why, and what, what differ, mm, and what make that, that banal or obvious uh, observation by Aristotle so important, is that uh, when the relation between wealth and poor degenerate, they can take all the, let's say, political subjecti subjectivity from the poor part. Of course, it doesn't mean that poor party, it's only, it, it, that's never, it's true, it's, it's, it's like now, it's not that 50% of people are poor, 50% are wealth, are rich. Uh, it's a question of, uh, let's say, that what Romans called clientism. So you have rich and the clients. And what makes nowadays situation so difficult in most cases in the West is that we have quasi 50-50 division, uh, which destroy a sense of the unity of nations. Uh, the problem with representation, of course, is connected with that. Uh, when, you, when you take under consideration the the idea which lies under the concept of gilet jaune, who wears yellow jacket on the road, that one who wants to be, that, that one who first wants to be seen and not to be killed. That's, I mean, two important reasons why, why, why we are using that on the road. So when people in some a tape of that of that of that movement, followed by, if I'm not wrong, around 60 percent of society, are finding this identity in that kind of where having no political ambitions. It means that crisis of representation is pretty high. It's pretty high. Uh, do, 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 I have a, do I have an answer where to go? No, I'm trying to, I'm trying to describe, that's, that's a job of a political philosopher, of de describing the tensions uh, and showing some alternatives and showing some, say, possibilities. But of course, uh, I'm not a politician, so I have no, no projects. I do believe myself in the um, solidarity, but as... Uh, political and theological project. So if no more questions, so thank you very much, Darius, once again. Thank you to all of you. Well, present here in Angelicum and in front of your screens. And I would like to invite you to an open seminar with Dr. Dariusz Karłowicz to be held tomorrow, Thursday at 9 a.m. in Aula 15, and for the next GP2 lecture to be given by Russell Urino, editor of First Things on March 15. Once again, thank you very much. <laughs>